Behind me where the trees are is the Hawthorne Ridge Crater. It's the site of one of nearly 20 mines that were exploded by the British on the morning of July 1st, 1916 to signal the start of the Somme Offensive. It's one of the most well-known of the craters and one of only a few that can still be seen today. The area that was targeted by the mine was known as Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt. That's the ridge there. It was a German frontline fortification west of the village of Beaumont Hamel on the Somme River. The redoubt was built after the end of the Battle of Albert in late September 1914. So the Germans had been there for the better part of a year and a half, almost two years at this point. And as the French and later the British attacks on the Western Front became more and more formidable, the Germans continued to build up the fortifications and trench positions near their original lines around Hawthorne Ridge. No man's land in this sector ranged anywhere from between 200 and 500 yards between the British and the German lines. The ground's mostly flat and clear of obstructions. It's got hills, you know, sloping ridges, but uh, there's one tiny spot in all of this sector that's not flat and in the open. And that is this low bank known as the Sunken Ridge. And we're gonna take a look at that in just a minute. This is a commanding position for the Germans. They could use it for artillery observers to easily see the British lines uh, and to be able to fire and coordinate that fire effectively. The British, on the other hand, couldn't see past the German support trenches. And the shape of this land, which is much more hilly than I thought it would be, the shape of the land here makes it very difficult for heavy artillery for the British to hit those German frontline positions. And so as the British prepared for their offensive along the Somme, the 29th Division was given the task of taking the Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt. To try and make their job a little bit easier, the um, division employed a series of miners uh, to dig mines for communication, for transportation, and of course for explosives detonation. The 252nd Tunneling Company of the Royal Engineers, who were nicknamed the Moles, were given the task. The main gallery was dug 60 feet underground and stretched a thousand yards, that's more than a half a mile, from the British lines to the strong point under the redoubt where those trees are. The mine was then packed with 40,000 pounds of explosives made from ammonium nitrate and aluminum powder. The 8th Corps commander, Lieutenant General uh, Aimer uh, Hunter Weston, that's a mouthful of a name, um, wanted to, the mine to be set off actually four hours before the attack so the Germans would think the attack was coming and then let their guard down when nothing happened. But... Uh, that was overruled by 4th Army Headquarters, and they decided that all mines should be detonated no more than just a few minutes before the attack. So every day for the week preceding the attack, a bombardment would con commence at 5 a.m. You figure if you're the Germans after a while, you really just don't know what's happening because no, no attack's coming. So the hope was that the Germans would think no attack was imminent when the bombardment occurred on the morning of the attack. So on the morning of July 1st, the men of the 29th Division were to advance east across the valley behind a creeping barrage that would get closer and closer to the German lines. They would first secure the very first line of defenses and then follow that artillery barrage as it crept further to the east so they could capture additional trench lines throughout the day. The Hawthorne Ridge mine was set to go off 10 minutes before the attack. That's several minutes before any of the other mines along the line. And the hope was that the German attention would not be focused or would be focused here and not on more strategic locations where the 10th Corps and the 15th Corps were going to be attacking further to the south.
British cinematographer Jeffrey Malins was on hand to film the attack by the 29th Division. The men of the 1st Battalion of the Lancashire Fusiliers had moved out into no man's land to this spot behind me known as the Sunken Road, which is one of the very few spots anywhere uh, on this part of the battlefield where you can get some uh, cover and not be out in the open. There's this iconic footage of the men of that unit here waiting to go over the top after the mine exploded. Within a half hour of that footage being shot, many of those men would be dead on the battlefield. Malins then went to another location and set up his camera to record the explosion of the Hawthorne mine from about a half a mile away. Here's what he said about it. He said, quote, The ground where I stood gave a mighty convulsion. It rocked and swayed. I gripped hold of my tripod to steady myself. Then for all the world, like a gigantic sponge, the earth rose high in the air to the height of hundreds of feet. Higher and higher it rose. And with a horrible, grinding roar, the earth settles back on itself, leaving in its place a mountain of smoke. End quote. As soon as the mine blew, the British artillery opened with what was known as a hurricane bombardment of the German lines. This was meant to be a quick but devastating precision artillery strike on the focal point of the attack. It didn't have the desired effect. Two platoons of the 2nd Battalion Royal Fusiliers, along with four machine guns and four Stokes mortars, went over the top and rushed toward the crater. The German position here at the Hawthorne Ridge Crater was defended by the 119th Regiment of the 26th Reserve Division. A soldier here on Hawthorne Ridge described from the German perspective what happened, quote, a huge explosion occurred. It was clear that this was not the result of shelling. A terrible rain of earth and stone was coming down on us and a gigantic cloud of dust and smoke was rising into the air just in front of where the 9th Company was positioned. The English had dug a tunnel towards a protruding corner of our defenses, which they called the Hawthorne Redoubt, and they had blown a huge mine below it. More than three groups, and there'd be 10 to 12 men in a group, 
of the 1st Platoon of 9th Company were killed outright. The dugouts next to them collapsed, trapping the men of four other groups inside. Only two groups could be rescued in time. The explosion had left a crater with a diameter of 50 to 60 meters and a depth of 30 meters and had set the signal for the start of the attack. As the Germans looked out, the the sun could be seen reflecting on the English bayonet. They were carrying bridges and wooden planks with them to cross the trenches. He said eight dense waves were coming up toward us. Horse artillery and cavalry could be observed. English staff officers were observing the assault, and the Germans could see all of this. He went on to say the 10th and 11th Company greeted the English with a withering hail of machine gun and rifle fire. In the section of 9th Company, which had been taken out of action by the mine, English bomb throwers and machine gunners managed to break into our trenches toward the left of the huge crater. Here, 3rd Platoon was still trapped inside a large dugout whose four exits had been collapsed when the mine was blown. One of these exits was just being opened up by one of the men. Behind this man were Lieutenant Breitmeier and Oberleutnant Mühlbeier. There was another German soldier who also wrote about what happened, and he described what happened next. Quote, We had only just opened the exit of the dugout when they were upon us. A bayonet thrust killed the man who was holding the shovel. His body fell down the stairs of the dugout, tearing the men that were just in the process of getting down out again. I had no rifle with me, but managed to fire a signal flare into the face of one of the attackers. The English answered by throwing some hand grenades, which forced us to withdraw back inside the dugout. A short and intense close combat developed in which the English were annihilated. Their leader, a most brave lieutenant, was wounded and taken prisoner. The platoon of 9th Company, who had just escaped from the collapsed dugout, now fanned out to man the defenses just in time to open fire on yet another wave of English infantry supported by machine guns. It was then the enemy broke and started toward his lines in retreat. At 11.30 hours, everything was over. I think it's important to remember as I stand in the middle of the Hawthorne Ridge crater that this is a war grave. There were dozens of German soldiers who were annihilated when this bomb exploded. Uh, Many of them probably blown into unrecoverable pieces, but also many buried beneath the tons of earth that were thrown into the air, and you can see that in the video. Uh, And so probably many of them have never been recovered. this is their final resting place. There is a sign here. It says Den Toten Kameraden. And it has a list of men who were killed on July 1st. And I'll just read a few of their names. Vermin Jacob uh, Noblich. Reservist Martin Waller. Reservist Eugen Kohler. 
Musketeer Lenhart Bloch. Musketeer Eugen Zundel. Unteroffizier Thomas Fischer. All of those and, and many other names on this list all died July 1st, 1960. Standing now in the Beaumont Hamel British Cemetery, you can see just right there the Hawthorne Ridge Crater. Just where these trees are is where the sunken lane is. And so many of these men were men that came up and over and probably died right in this field. I thought this, however, was unusual in this cemetery. You see um, a member of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment who was killed in November. In November, there was another significant attack on Hawthorne Ridge, which finally took the position. Uh, and so in a lot of these cemeteries, you'll see a lot of July dates and a lot of November dates because men were killed in the same location, fighting over the same ground at different times. Here you see Private J.W. Jackson of the Lancashire Fusiliers, who was killed probably very near to this spot on July 1st. But then it's right here, what's next that surprised me. It's an unknown German soldier who somehow ended up in the middle of this British cemetery and has been given uh, the same similar type of marker that all the British soldiers are. And that's one of the things that continues to surprise me in my time in France is the honor that has been shown to the Germans. To their soldiers it's um well i it warms my heart but i would totally understand if they didn't feel that way they were invaded by these people and yet they they show great honor to them not only from the french but the british as well